final speaker in the session is John Briggs, who runs a private observatory in Colorado for a nonprofit foundation. For 13 years, he served as an instrumentation engineer at Yerkes Observatory, involved in projects ranging from winter over at South Pole Station, participation in the final commissioning of the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. He is past president of the Antique Telescope Society, and will still speak today about an obscure small telescope. Thank you. Um, yes. Actually, I can just hit the, I'm going to stand right here. I don't think I need the remote. But. I, I work on getting the video to work first. Oh, yeah. That's but, uh, I'm okay, Owen. I'm just going to hit the space bar. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. I'm okay with that, believe me. All right. I don't have that many slides. There. Okay. I came to this event for my own continuing education, and of course I haven't been disappointed. It occurred to me suddenly and unexpectedly that I might be able to contribute something appropriate for the discussion. My own special interest is history of instrumentation, and the artifact I'll describe briefly for you relates to the career of Heber D. D. Curtis, famous as a pioneer in the understanding of galaxies, and for his role in the so-called great, great Debate of 1920 with Harlow Shapley. Heber Curtis was born in 1872 and attended Detroit High School. As a student, he showed no particular interest in science, but he was good in mathematics. He attended the University of Michigan and, having decided to become a classics teacher, he took all the Latin and Greek courses offered there and also studied Hebrew, Assyrian, and Sanskrit. In, in four years, he completed bachelor and master degrees. According to Donald Ostbrock, writing for American National Biography, Curtis never visited Michigan's Detroit Observatory to see the 12-inch refractor there. He was, however, interested in machine tool work from his boyhood. After graduation, Curtis found a job as a professor of Latin and Greek at Napa College, north of San Francisco. Na Napa had an eight-inch telescope with optics by Alvin Clark and Sons of Cambridgeport, Massachusetts, mounted by Falcon Company of Washington, D.C. Curtis took an interest in it. In 1896, shortly after Curtis's arrival, Napa merged with College of the Pacific in San Jose. College of the Pacific also had an observatory with the Clark Telescope, an unusually beautiful and intricate six-inch dated 1884 with a weight-driven equatorial mounting and a filer micrometer, all built by the Clark firm. There was also an elaborate transit telescope built by Falcon Company. Within one year of his start there, Curtis began teaching mathematics and astronomy. It's easy to imagine how the instrumentation attracted him given his interest in machine tool work. He spent six weeks during the summer of 1897 uh, at Lick Observatory atop nearby Mount Hamilton as a special student and volunteer assistant. And, encouraged by Lick director Edward S. Holden, he returned the following summer. During the summer of 1899, the following summer, uh, he returned to Ann Arbor and finally entered Detroit Observatory studying celestial mechanics. In 1900, Curtis participated in the Lick Observatory Solar Eclipse Expedition in Thomason, Georgia. W. W. Campbell was favorably impressed with the practical skills Curtis displayed and encouraged him to return to graduate school. Curtis was rejected as a graduate student at Lick and Yerkes Observatories, but with a strong recommendation from Campbell, he attended the University of Virginia on a fellowship paying $350 per year completing a PhD in 1902. The career change pursu pursued by Curtis had been all the more daring given that he had married in 1895 and had two small children when he began the fellowship. His gamble paid off, however, in that, half, in in that after completing his studies at Virginia, he was immediately hired onto the Lick staff by Campbell, the new director. Let's now examine the six-inch telescope used by Curtis at the College of the Pacific, photographed as it was set up for you in the Lowell Rotunda Thursday, 
We can imagine how, were it not for his experience with this appealing telescope, Curtis might not have undertaken his unusual career change into astronomy. And there it is, and I guess I'm just going to go through these slides. There. Someone mentioned uh, art and science uh, yesterday, or was it the day before? In my mind, looking at these, many of these old instruments, they're very much like sculpture. The makers of these instruments put, put details and efforts in that far transcended utilitarian uh, necessity, uh, and they were just beautiful works of art. For if, you, if you have spent some time in a machine shop and look at one of these instruments, it's, it's, even to this day, it's hard to imagine just how they did some of the things uh, it, re reflected in the design of the instrument. Uh, the door opens and there's a beautiful weight-driven clock mechanism inside there. Very few um, uh, old Clark telescopes survive with the original mechanisms because so frequently they were <coughs> electrified. But this is the real McCoy. Those are lead weights, and there's a little bit of dust and corrosion uh, with the oxidation of the lead. They swing out and it is part of the governor mechanism. Uh, it's very intricate, and it's easy to imagine Curtis becoming an amateur astronomer fascinated with this, uh, observing with it one thing leading to another, and, and his interest in astronomy taking over his interest in all those languages. Uh, the telescope was complete with the beautiful uh, uh, vernier scales and silver inlay, so that, not, as is typical for these instruments, so that you not only point it with coarse scales and the setting circles, but if need be, uh, via magnifiers and vernier scales, reading typically to a, maybe a minute of arc. Just beautifully intricate stuff. And it was also equipped with a filer micrometer for measuring double stars. And interestingly, not only Curtis used this tall scope, but uh, Robert Aitken, who became such a famous uh, uh, observer of binary stars at Lick Observatory, apparently had some early exposure to this tall scope. Uh, we can also see uh, the Fountain Company Transit Telescope, also used by Curtis at College of the Pacific. The transit alone cost $1,000. Here, just one picture of it and another. Beautiful stuff. I'm indebted to Don Osterbrock for biographical details of Curtis's life. Writing to me in 2000, Don said, Thanks for your message about the University of Pacific 6-inch, which got Curtis into astronomy. I have heard of it, but never seen it. I didn't realize the lens was missing. Stolen, I suppose that means. I am very interested in Curtis, and I am glad you are, too. I'll conclude with a reading from Osterbrock's biography of Curtis. His greatest triumph was his recognition that the spiral nebulae which Keeler had found to be so numerous in the sky, were in fact galaxies, remote star systems, or island universes. Curtis reached this conclusion from his study of the long exposure photographs he obtained with the cross and reflector. That, of course, was a lick. From them, he came to understand that the dark markings so prominent in the nearly edge-on objects result from obscuring material within the galaxies interstellar dust into, in today's terminology. Curtis recognized the analogy between our Milky Way and edge-on spirals, and he suspected that they, and hence all spiral nebulae, are star systems. Having made these photographs myself, uh, it's easy to imagine how morphology alone inspired Curtis in his beliefs even before Ritchie's 1917 discovery of a nova in a spiral galaxy that began to give Curtis proof that the spirals were vastly distant. A final detail regarding the 1884 Clark telescope itself, it and the other instruments in the observatory at the College of the Pacific 
were donated by Captain Charles Goodall of San Francisco and David Jacks of Monterey. David Jacks, also known as David Jack, is especially interesting in his own right, a Scotsman who emigrated to California in 1849 with a relatively small amount of capital, he soon came to own some 60,000 acres. These included the present-day cities of Pacific Grove, Delray Oaks, Del Oaks, and Seaside, the Del Monte Forest, Fort Ward, Pebble Beach, and the spectacular coastline of 17 Mile Drive. Monterey Jack Cheese is said to be named after him. So I suggest you choose it when you see it at the grocery store <laughs> and have a bite in celebration of the historical circumstances and connections that brought us along in our understanding of the cosmos. <laughs> I'd be very interested, uh, maybe examining the telescope directly with you, to get your sense of what is uh, functional and what is ornamental. The spokes and the setting circles are among the features that blow my mind because they have angles that are just very difficult to deal with in a machine shop, but the makers went to these lengths, it seems to me, to simply make it look great and maybe help command the price they charge for it. <laughs> right, can we thank all the speakers? For this?